basically another study about whether um, there is added a value to getting a coronary CTA in the emergency department to uh, further stratify risk with uh, coronary CTA over standard of care. Um, and it's of note it's done in uh, the Netherlands, so it's a little bit different. Man, like standard of care is a little bit different than what we would necessarily do here. Very different, actually. <laughs> I think that was Danish, wasn't it? Danish. That was a French study. Say what? Jack. Main Jack. Jack? No, I don't think we <laughs> <laughs> No, no, remember that, remember that mentioned that there was a study published? Yeah. That's good that we... I'm going to really nail down coronary CTA by the end of this, this year. So I'm going to redo everything once that CTA bar is <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I guess their main, what they felt like this added was that uh, most of the main studies kind of validating coronary CTA and the emergency department were uh, done prior to the advent of uh, high sensitivity troponins assays. Um, and they mentioned that basically because they're very sensitive, um, the you can get basically a 97% negative predictive value just by getting two negative troponins three hours apart with, with in certain low and intermediate risk populations. Um, so you can rule out a lot of patients without really even doing imaging or, or further risk stratification. So the population that they used was basically any patient coming to the emergency department with acute chest pain, not easily attributable to other causes, and um, not needing to go to more invasive strategies early. So, um, so basically, they define that as not having a troponin three times upper limit of the 99th percentile of, um, of tr the troponin values. Um, and also, patients. these are patients that did not have any known CAD prior to this uh, presentation. So... Um, and their primary endpoint that they were trying to establish was whether this would identify more patients that required coronary revascularization within the 30-day time window. Um, and you could argue whether that's a reasonable endpoint or not. Yeah, so they're trying to identify more patients that needed revascularization, basically. Um, so they want to see if you were increased the number? Of cap of intervention, yes, revascularization. So, uh, apparently, there was like a smaller pilot study where it did increase it to some extent. Um, yeah, especially as their primary endpoint. There was some other stuff that. Well, this is intervention, not necessarily just diagnostic. Right. Right. Um, and then their secondary endpoints were to see if it would lead to more a higher percentage of expedited ER discharge, um, and they defined that as being discharged within eight hours of presentation, um, length of hospital stay, uh, undetected ACS was kind of a safety endpoint, uh, cumulative radiation again, a little bit of a. I guess see how much it would increase radiation. Um, the, they compared direct medical costs of the two different strategies, and uh, then another safety endpoint was repeat ER visits or hospitalizations in both groups. Um, so this is kind of their <coughs> flow chart that if you can read that. The writing's a little small, but basically, so people with suspected ACS and they underwent initial 
work up with troponins and 12 lead EKG. If it was clearly non cardiac, they were excluded. If it was very likely ACS, such as uh, ST segment changes or uh, you know significantly elevated troponins or any sign of clinical instability, then they were excluded. They were also excluded if they were going to be admitted for another cause beyond just the chest pain that they presented for. So if they also had like heart failure or something, they obviously would be excluded. Or if they had a known pneumonia, then they'd be excluded. Anything else that would require them to be admitted otherwise. Um, <coughs> no, no history of CAD. So they exclude those who had Correct. Um, the one we discussed, they excluded. Yeah. Um, they also included people with contrast excluded people with contrast allergies or depressed renal functions, which kind of makes sense because you don't well, want. How many patients were excluded? Percentage. Uh, I think they said 13 percent total were excluded. Well, actually, I can't remember if it was 13 percent excluded or 13 percent refused consent. I think it was 13 percent that were excluded. Say that again. They enrolled 500 patients, 47% um, female. Let me go to table one. Um, it's kind of a moderate risk population. There's not a ton of risk factors. Uh, you know, a lot of them have hypertension, or you know, probably six, one sixth of them have hypertension. 12%, uh, as you can see, have diabetes. Uh, 10 to 12 percent have high cholesterol. Uh, there's a pretty high percentage of smoker, smokers, um, a relatively low percentage of any prior vascular disease, including TIAs, peripheral arterial disease. As we mentioned, coronary disease was excluded. Um, and then probably 40 percent had greater than two as their TIMI score. Um, Do they give any score? Say that again. Or what? The pagan population. They got Timmy and Grace. But Grace, obviously, they weren't super high because they excluded everybody with any instability. Um, and I can't see it from here. Timmy greater than two was uh, 92 in the coronary CT population and 76 in the standard of care population. Less than two, is that right? Greater than or equal to two. They're all, they're so that's like about any, that's any about forty percent low grade risk scores. So forty percent with two or higher. Yeah. That's not very low. Risk, huh? No, I mean and. It's not higher risk than the chest pain. Grade is low. Is it is it percent or absolute? Those are absolute. These are absolute the numbers though. Absolute. So this is like forty percent, about thirty forty percent. That's 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 very important, you know. Uh, if you need two or higher. That's yeah, but if you look at the grace risk score, 85% of them are low risk. I mean, you know, if they're just old and they can ask for it, they've got two. So, but if you look at the grace, most the, of them the average age was 54, so they had something else besides just age and as, besides just age. Not the, not the very low risk patient that we see here. Okay, um, that's why it's just important to know your patient population. Yeah, and with the grace scores, like, Basically, they have a high grade score. You got to be somewhat unstable, and they excluded any sort of hemodynamic instability. So, by definition, they're not going to be super high grade scores. Um, if they have signs of heart failure, they're probably not going to enroll them. Yeah, none of those scores are designed for this type of patient. Right. Those are designed for much higher risk patients. And there's some other scores that you know some people use it find it better, but bottom line, it's not centralized. Yeah. Um, you see that you know a few of them have somewhat elevated troponins, and not three times upper limit of normal. And there were a few ischemic CG abnormalities in both groups, but again, not a very not a super high percentage, uh, about a one fifth to one fourth. Um, and I guess the other thing is. As you can see here, it was open label. Obviously, it's kind of hard to blind doing a CT, uh, especially if you're, you 
are making decisions based on the results. Either you have the data or you don't. Um, so I guess on to um, what they found. Um, so I guess one thing that was a lot different than what we would necessarily do here is a lot of these patients, so what they did is they did whatever they wanted to do in the ER and um, then they had them follow up in 48 to 72 hours in clinic for everybody. Um, so that's a little, I mean, like, and they didn't necessarily have definitive management beyond just troponin, like, troponins in the emergency department. So in, so I guess, first of all, the primary outcome, it was negative. It was like 9% versus 7% where we were, ended up getting revascularization of some sort, um, which obviously is not significant. How many patients? How many? 500 patients total, 9%. Um, so how many exact patients that is? About 10% of 500 to 50 or so. 9% in C CCTA and 7% uh, in the standard of care arm. Or for, so not a. In more detail, in standard of care, what kind of tests they underwent? Yeah, if you look right here, uh, if you can read that, I don't know. It's basically, if they underwent anything, the vast majority underwent exercise EKG, which again is a little different than what we would do here. Uh, very few, I think seven patients underwent nuclear. So. Um, what percentage is that? Angiomech. What percentage is what? Angiomech. Um, yeah. Uh, or, or any other imaging modality other than a stress, a treadmill EKG would not be right. very, very low sensitivity. Right. Very few, very few. One arm is EKG and Conan's, and the other is CTA. You've got specs, you you're gonna, you're gonna under, You're going to be under sensitive on, the, on one arm. Right, I agree. And again, that's a huge difference from what we would do here. Additionally, a lot of these patients were getting it as an outpatient after they had just rolled out troponin. So they discharged 60, no, sorry, 59% uh, of the standard of care patients were discharged from the emergency department, which we would never do here, obviously. Here we have chest pain units, but remember those are technically outpatient units. <laughs> these patients were discharged in 6.3 hours. When was the last so time somebody got discharged in 6.3 hours? We can do that here. In fact, a lot of places will do that. But the reason we don't often do that here is because you need to have a guaranteed follow-up. Yeah. People who are uninsured or out of town are not easy to follow up within 20 to 40 hours. That's a problem. They don't have the potential either. Yeah. So here in the, in the Dutch system, I'm sure they can arrange that prior to leaving the ER. No, no, I, I understand that. It's not what we do here. So it's an important difference from from our, you know, what would be our, maybe not standard of care, but typical practices. How long you do the days? Just look at the dog thing. Um, as far as what? I'm sorry. Resource uh, they they did a cost analysis, and the average cost was three hundred and thirty-seven dollars in the CTA or sorry euros in the CTA arm, and uh, five hundred and eleven in the standard of care arm. So there was a little bit of. Did they explain why they're more expensive? Um, I'm thinking right, you're not putting the skipping a test. Right. And you're in the in some similar amount, so what's the cost coming from? Yeah, they didn't really give a great explanation for that. I think they ended up getting more testing as an outpatient beyond what the CTA arm got. So basically, once they got the CTA, most of them didn't get any more any further testing as an outpatient. Um, they gave a percentage on that. Office visits and outpatient follow-up. But yeah, you get multiple office visits. There were seven specs and three CMRs, which would, and then they commented on this and said they did some sort of analysis to make sure it wasn't difference. But the three of the patients in the um, standard of care arm ended up getting uh, cabbages there, or four patients, sorry, and they got ended up getting cabbages as opposed to PCI. So you would imagine that would have a little bit. Yeah. Longer hospital stay, more expense. And um, not the patient in CTA on my No. So, 
17 got revascularized in the standard care arm, and four, four were cabbage versus 22 in the CTA arm, and nine, uh, sorry, none were cabbage. They were all PCI. What about the numbers that got invasive? Yeah, that's that one. Um, yeah. Can't see it oh, sorry. Here you go. <laughs> this is what I was looking for earlier. 41, 41 patients, so 17% the CTA arm, and 31 patients, for, uh, which is 13% in the standard of care arm. More in the CTA arm. Correct. Is, kind of expected. How about how many patients in the CTA arm end up having some non-invasive testing? Uh, it was a pretty low percentage. They that was back on the other. So uh, 32 got an exercise EKG, which is 13%. Um, two got a SPECT, and one got a CMR. So that's a total of 56 patients. No, sorry. No, not even that. 30, 35 patients total got some other sort of non-invasive management. Um, and only, I think, three or four patients got a CTA in the standard of care arm, and they kind of talked about why that was. There was one they suspected this section, a couple that they thought had a PE. Um, so it was a little bit of crossover, but not anything huge. Um, and again, obviously significantly less outpatient testing in the... So basically, <laughs> according to them, it's a little bit cheaper. Right. That they don't go home sooner. Correct, because again, they discharge them within like because six the hours in the standard care. Right. Say, say that again. Because the study design, right? Right. So again, if we were doing it in our practice environment where we are going to bring them in, get either a new, probably a nuke, which would be more expensive than an exercise <laughs> treadmill, and we're going to do it as an inpatient, um, that might probably would have more of a cost difference and probably more of a length of stay difference. Now Which is have, similar to what we found in. You have to remember the cost is very difficult to define. You know? Right. You know, same machine, same CTA, same spec system, same employee, same doctor to read it. It's done Smith Tower versus Founder 9. That's a great cost. Yeah. Right. They talked about that too. Apparently, in the Netherlands, there's no difference in cost between inpatient and outpatient studies. So again, that's another big, kind of big difference that... What's that conclusion? Um, basically, the conclusion is that in patients being ruled out with high sensitivity troponin, there's... and in this sort of practice environment where um, you have much better access to outpatient primary care, there's not as much of a difference as far as cost or length of stay as you would have been seen in previous American studies.